Well, hello there. I'm Nurse Mo and welcome or welcome back. This is the Straight A Nursing Podcast where I teach nursing concepts and share tips on how to thrive in school and at the bedside. So today we're diving into a pediatric topic. We're going to be talking about hormonal disorders in children. Now, before we do that, let's take a quick minute for the listener shout out. And this one goes out to April, who wrote in to say this. I'm in my last term of nursing school and this podcast and Nurse Mo have helped me through the entire process. I listen to the podcast on my commute to and from work, on my runs and while cleaning the house. I'm able to go about life and study without being stuck at my desk. I've gained so much knowledge through your podcast, notes on your website, and your Facebook group. Thank you for all of your resources and teaching in a way that's easy to understand and for giving us some giggles along the way. I can't tell you how much you're appreciated. Well, thank you so much, April, and way to go. You're almost done with nursing school. Please reach back out and let me know when you get your license so I can celebrate right along with you. All righty. So if you're curious what April was talking about when she mentioned my Facebook group, I have a really positive, empowering, awesome Facebook group full of amazing people. It's called Thriving Nursing Students, and you can find that on Facebook. Okay, so we're looking at hormonal disorders in children today. So as a reminder, Hormones are chemical messengers in the body that travel through the bloodstream to specific receptors on cells throughout the body where they elicit some kind of a response. Hormones play a really key role in many physiologic processes, including metabolism, blood pressure regulation, blood glucose regulation, growth and development, reproduction, the sleep-wake cycle, and mood. This lesson provides a brief overview of some key pediatric hormone disorders. So first, we'll talk briefly about type 1 diabetes. So type 1 diabetes mellitus is an autoimmune disorder, and this occurs when the body's immune system attacks and destroys those beta cells of the pancreas, and those are the cells that produce insulin. It is generally diagnosed in childhood, so you may see it referred to as juvenile diabetes. Now, the classic signs of type 1 diabetes are polydipsia, polyuria, polyphagia, and weight loss. So excessive thirst, drinking a lot, urinating a lot, and really hungry, eating a lot. And along with that extra hunger comes weight loss as well. Other signs and symptoms include weakness, fatigue, severe diaper rash that may not respond well to treatments, yeast infections in females, and mood changes. And then a serious complication of diabetes mellitus is diabetic ketoacidosis. And when that develops, the child may have decreased level of consciousness, rapid and deep breathing called Kussmaul respirations, and fruity smelling breath. So diabetes is treated with insulin, and the child will need to have their blood sugar tested multiple times per day. In addition, the child will need to follow a carb-consistent diet and avoid skipping meals. We don't want to give a child insulin and then have them not eat, and then their blood sugar crashes. And you can imagine how challenging this must be with toddlers if you've spent any time with toddlers, you know that they eat when they eat and they don't necessarily want to eat at specific times. And if they're not hungry, there's really nothing you can do to get them to eat. So I imagine parents of diabetic children, just they really have a lot of challenges and my heart goes out to them. Now, it's important that parents and older children recognize the signs of hypoglycemia and understand that too much insulin or something like inadequate food intake and excess or extra exercise or really any exercise can cause blood glucose levels to decrease. So this would put them at risk for hypoglycemia. And just as a reminder, those signs of hypoglycemia could include things like shakiness, a headache, the child being more irritable than usual, maybe paleness to their skin color. They may be exhibiting signs of extra hunger or even sweating a bit. 
and maybe just crying for no apparent reason. So depending on the age of the child, of course, how they're going to be able to tell you that they have symptoms is going to be very different. An older child can convey their symptoms, whereas a younger child and a baby obviously cannot. Now, the treatment for hypoglycemia is administration of glucose in some form. This may be having the child drink some juice, maybe eating something sugary like cake frosting or cake icing. You may need to utilize IM glucagon for a child who maybe can't swallow safely, maybe has decreased level of consciousness, or in the clinical setting, IV dextrose is often used. Now let's talk a little bit about type 2 diabetes mellitus. So this used to be called adult onset diabetes because we thought it only occurred in adults, but it is now occurring in children, unfortunately, due to the increase in childhood obesity. In addition to being overweight, other risk factors for the development of type 2 diabetes in children include inactivity, a diet that is high in red meat, a diet high in processed foods, and a diet high in sugar, especially those really sugary beverages. Other children at risk are those with low birth weight or preterm birth, children who are born to women who had gestational diabetes, and children with a family history of type 2 diabetes. They're going to be at higher risk for the development of type 2 diabetes. So when a child has type 2 diabetes, they're treated with a combination of pharmacologic interventions, which can include insulin, and also may include oral hypoglycemic or anti-diabetic medications and lifestyle changes that include losing weight if there's excess weight to lose, increasing activity, and following a healthy diet. So if you want to dive deeper into diabetes and really go into all the details, you can learn more about it in episode 304, which was just from a couple of weeks back. Okay, now let's talk about thyroid disorders, hyperthyroidism and hypothyroidism. Hyperthyroidism occurs when the thyroid produces an excess amount of thyroid hormone. The two main hormones are thyroxine, which is T4, and triiodothyronine, which is much easier to say as T3. But I have to be honest, I'm pretty sure I nailed that one. And there are people out there who love to comment on my pronunciations. So I hope you're proud of me. I've been working on it very, very much. So thyroid hormones impact cells throughout the body. And they play a key role in things like controlling heart rate, temperature, protein synthesis, and metabolism. So the most common cause of hyperthyroidism in children is Graves' disease, an autoimmune condition in which antibodies cause that thyroid to release excess hormone. Now, some other possible causes of hyperthyroidism include thyroid nodules, also known as goiter, and these are growths at the thyroid gland that can produce excess thyroid hormone. Thyroiditis, which is inflammation of the thyroid. Remember, itis means inflammation. This causes the gland to leak extra hormones into the bloodstream. This condition may often resolve on its own. Neonatal Graves' disease is rare, but can occur when the mother has Graves' disease and her antibodies cross the placenta and affect the thyroid gland of the fetus. Also, an excess of dietary iodine, which can be in the form of supplements, maybe someone's just taking too many iodine supplements, or even from eating a lot of iodine-rich foods like seaweed. And then taking too much thyroid hormone replacement can also lead to hyperthyroidism. So if you have a child with hypothyroidism who's taking levothyroxine, if they take too much, that leads to hyperthyroidism. So the classic signs and symptoms of hyperthyroidism in children include things like tachycardia, increased blood pressure, weight loss, increased appetite, tremors, sweating and heat intolerance, loose stools, hyperactivity, difficulty concentrating, difficulty sleeping or insomnia, and in the case of Graves' disease, the child could have the bulging eyes, the thyroid eye disease, or TED. 
untreated hyperthyroidism can lead to cognitive delays in children under three years of age and can be life-threatening for a child of any age, especially newborns. In addition, hyperthyroidism can cause children to grow quickly when they're younger, but growth tends to stop early, leading to an overall short stature. To learn more about the treatments for hyperthyroidism and more about the condition, then I want you to review episode 61. Again, that's episode 61. Now, what about hypothyroidism? So hypothyroidism is a condition in which there is not enough thyroid hormones in the body. And we'll talk about four key types. First, we'll talk about congenital hypothyroidism. So in congenital hypothyroidism, the thyroid gland fails to develop properly in utero. This condition is so common, occurring in one in every 2,500 to 3,000 children, that all babies in the U.S. are tested for this condition. Note that congenital hypothyroidism can be chronic, but it can also be transient in babies whose mothers took antithyroid medications to treat hyperthyroidism during pregnancy. Overall, left untreated, congenital hypothyroidism can cause significant mental and physical developmental delays. And then there's acquired hypothyroidism. So acquired hypothyroidism is typically caused by an autoimmune disorder called chronic lymphocytic thyroiditis. You may know it more by Hashimoto's thyroiditis. It is more common in girls and in those with other autoimmune conditions such as type 1 diabetes. And then we have iatrogenic hypothyroidism. This form of hypothyroidism occurs in children who have had their thyroid either partially or fully removed or ablated. So maybe they had hyperthyroidism, they had their thyroid removed, now they have iatrogenic hypothyroidism. And then central hypothyroidism. In central hypothyroidism, a disorder of the pituitary or hypothalamus causes insufficiency in thyroid-stimulating hormone, or TSH. Without this key hormone, the thyroid gland itself is not stimulated to produce and secrete T3 and T4. It is usually related to a benign brain tumor called a craniopharyngioma or prior radiation therapy for a brain tumor. Children with central hypothyroidism may have deficiencies in other hormones such as growth hormone, antidiuretic hormone, or adrenocorticotropic hormone, among others. Some signs and symptoms of hypothyroidism include fatigue, slowed mental processes or brain fog, though I'm not sure a child would describe it as brain fog, but that's often how it's described in adults, a slower heart rate weight gain, constipation, dry and thinning hair, an intolerance to cold, a hoarse voice possibly, facial edema can occur, and a goiter may be present. The condition is typically treated with levothyroxine, and you can learn all the details about hypothyroidism and associated treatments in episode 58. All right, now let's talk about growth hormone deficiency. So growth hormone deficiency, or GHD, is a condition in which the pituitary does not produce an adequate amount of growth hormone. This can be due to underdevelopment or damage to the pituitary or hypothalamus, but it can also be idiopathic, meaning we're not really sure why it's happening. Some common specific causes of acquired GHD include brain injury, a brain tumor, and radiation treatments to the head. A child with GHD will be of short stature, typically less than 5% on the growth chart, and the growth follows kind of a typical pattern. The child's growth may be normal earlier on, but then it's going to start slowing down and very specifically looking at the child's growth slowing each year after their third birthday, to where they have just a total gain of less than 1.4 inches per year, so growing very, very slowly. Other manifestations include delayed permanent teeth, underdevelopment of the lower jaw, and delayed puberty. 
Children with GHD are of normal intelligence as the condition does not affect cognitive development. However, due to their small size, they may have emotional or academic problems related to lower self-esteem and others treating them as much, much younger than they actually are. Now, growth hormone deficiency is diagnosed through blood tests and imaging studies to estimate bone age, which will be less than the child's calendar age. The treatment for GHD is daily injections of synthetic growth hormone until puberty is complete, and children have better outcomes when treatment is started early. So now let's look at the other side. So GHD involves hypopituitarism. On the other side, we have hyperpituitarism or too much pituitary happening. Though rare in children, hyperpituitarism can occur in those with small benign pituitary tumors called a microadenoma. The condition can also cause a wide range of hormonal disorders, including hypercortisolism, which is Cushing syndrome, hyperthyroidism, hypothyroidism, and acromegaly. So children with acromegaly have an increased amount of growth hormone, which can lead to unusually long legs, unusually long arms, a height up to eight feet tall, and changes in facial structure, such as a larger brow, more prominent brow, and jaw. Treatments are aimed at the specific hormonal disorder the child has for their hyperpituitarism. In the case of acromegaly, they may receive medication to lower growth hormone levels and undergo a surgical procedure called a transphenoidal adenomectomy, which removes that tumor. And then the last hormonal disorder we're looking at today in this overview is congenital adrenal hyperplasia or CAH. So in congenital adrenal hyperplasia, a specific enzyme that is needed to produce aldosterone and cortisol does not work properly. Children with congenital adrenal hyperplasia have cortisol insufficiency, adrenal insufficiency, altered growth patterns with early rapid growth but overall shorter stature, atypical genitalia and excess androgens leading to early puberty, leading to acne, and hirsutism. When diagnosed prenatally, treatment involves maternal dexamethasone administration, and then infants and children will take replacement hormones, which can include corticosteroids to replace cortisol, and possibly mineral corticoids to replace aldosterone and help maintain sodium and potassium levels. So this will become a lot more clear to you if you have an understanding about adrenal disorders. And if you're a little fuzzy on that topic, it's okay. I've covered it in detail in episode 77. So make sure you go and listen to that. So with this overview, I've linked you to other episodes where I dive deeper into each topic, but I hope this gives you a good idea of an overview and introduction to hormonal disorders in children. And I'm really excited about next week's episode. So I hope that you come join me back here for that. If everything goes according to plan, I'm having Kylie from Passports and Premies. She's a nurse and she has a website and a blog. And I think she also has a podcast called Passports and Premies. She is a travel. NICU nurse, and she has some amazing tips on getting into travel nursing and all the benefits of that super cool career path that she is on and some great stories to share. So hopefully, fingers are crossed, everything works out, and we get to talk to Kylie in our next episode. So I will see you back here for that next week. Bye for now. This podcast is brought to you by Straight A Nursing.